Well, good morning. Um, so today we're going to be looking at the, um, the, the final chapter of 2 Timothy. Um, so this is the, the end of our sermon series on Timothy. Um, and so these um, words that we're looking at, these are Paul's final words to Timothy. Timothy, who he um, described at the beginning of this letter as his beloved son. So these are his last words to him. Um, and these verses are sort of the, they're sort of the now what of First and Second Timothy, having, um, having read through these two letters, um, what do we do with it? Um, after everything that Paul has said, what is Timothy supposed to do now? And what are we as God's people? What are we supposed to do now? Um, so about 10 years ago, um, National Geographic released a, a documentary called Preppers UK. Um, and this was a, a, a film that explored the lives of, of kind of these you know, seemingly ordinary people all around the UK who were preparing themselves for a global catastrophe. Um, they had stockpiles of food. They had survival gear. Sometimes it was in a closet in their home. Um, other times it was in um, some sort of secret, undisclosed location. Um, they conducted training exercises. Um, they, would, they would go out, they would, they would do things like, you know, kind of this extreme camping where it was just them and a backpack, and then they would try to survive for like a weekend by only foraging for food or hunting or, um, or fishing. Um, there was this one guy who would time himself. He would run these drills. And so he had this like this Land Rover with like a trailer behind it with like all the gear they needed. And he would do these, these drills with his family to see how quickly they could load up into this Land Rover, flee their house and get to this like cabin that they had up in North Wales. Um, and then they would spend the, the weekend there. And all of these preppers, they were doing all of these different things. Um, they had all these different strategies because they had, they had these different ideas about the future. Um, and about what was coming. But they all held one thing in common. They held on to a deep uncertainty about the future. Whether it was a global financial collapse, whether it was political unrest, whether it was this one guy was worried about a solar flare that was just going to knock out all electronics all over the earth through a, like this massive EMP. But whatever it was, these people were preparing for a day when disaster would strike. Um, for them, uh, the breakdown of society or the downfall of governments, that wasn't a matter of if, but when. When this happens, we need to be ready. And so anxiety about the future was driving these men and women to, to prepare themselves. Um, for some, it was, it was just sort of a quirky, um, sort of a better safe than sorry kind of a weekend activity. Um, for other people, it, it was bordering on obsession. Um, prepping had become the single most important thing in their lives. Now, doomsday preppers might be people who go to greater extremes than, than you or I would. Um, but we all understand uncertainty about the future. We all understand that. We, we don't know what's coming. So how do we prepare? And so we put money into savings. Uh, we plan for retirement. Uh, we have things like an evacuation plan if there's a fire in our home. Um, we do things to prepare ourselves um, because we want to be prepared for a future that's unknown. As Paul writes these final words to Timothy, he tells him to be prepared. But he doesn't tell him to be prepared because the future is unknown. God's people need to be prepared because we know what is going to happen. For us, the future isn't unknown or uncertain. And so that doesn't mean that we know the individual events that are going to come to pass. But it means whatever comes to pass, God is still in control. We know where our hope and our joy and our peace, we know where they come from. They don't come from the world around us, but from the one who made the world around us. For every question, for every doubt, for every uncertainty that we have, Paul says there's one thing that we should do, one thing that we should be prepared to do. And so we're going we're gonna to see that in this text this morning. And so, um, and so if you would, um, we're looking on page, where does it start? Page 996. So it's the final chapter um, of 2 Timothy, chapter 4. 
And, and so Paul's going to describe for us, what is the one thing that God's people should always be prepared to do? Please follow along as I, as I read chapter four of second Timothy. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching for the time is coming when people will, when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Tychius I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all, the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm, and the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prissa and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, and I left Trophimus, who was ill, at Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greetings to you, as do Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the other brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and for this time that we have together this morning. Father, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would give us ears to hear and hearts to believe the good news of your word for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's, um, so there's this scene that kind of unfolds in, in my house. Um, almost every time Liz and I need to leave to, to go out on a date or, or to go um, to something in the evening, and we, have to, and we have to leave Finn with a babysitter. And so it goes like this. You know, the babysitter arrives. And it really doesn't matter how well prepared we are, if we're dressed and ready to go, um, if we've done all the things we've needed to do, it doesn't matter. There's always this flurry of activity um, and all this communication that has to happen right before we can leave. Um, and so if you're a parent who has left your kids with a babysitter, or if you're a kid who's been left with a babysitter, or if you have been that babysitter, then perhaps you've seen something similar to, the, to what happens in our house. Right, as soon as the babysitter walks in the door, there's, there's just this sort of rapid, like, you know, info dump that has to happen. Um, there's, there's pizza on the kitchen table, and there's, there's popcorns and, and grapes if he wants to have a snack, but he needs to eat his dinner first. Um, bedtime is at 8 o'clock, and here's some books that you can read to him. Like, three books. He'll ask for more. Just three books. Um, this, is the, this is where we'll be. Um, please call us if you need anything. You know, make yourself at home. Here's, here's how to operate the TV and get to Netflix and to Disney Plus and whatever. There's, there's tea and there's biscuits in the kitchen. So like, help yourself to that. Um, do you have any questions? Is there anything that we forgot? And then we, and then we ask Finn. And we say, Finn, who's in charge of you while we're away? And he'll, he'll say, you know, the babysitter's name. You know, she's, she's in charge. And then we give him kisses and we give him hugs and then we tell him that we love him and that we'll be home soon. And then we ask the babysitter one more time, 
Right? It, any questions, anything that we forgot. And then we finally, like, we step out the door and we're ready to go. Um, and so anytime we go out, you know, there's, there's always this, this last minute scramble. We're trying to cover all the things, the big things and the little things, anything that might come up while we're away. So that's kind of what Paul is doing here at the end of Second Timothy. I mean, as we read through this, you kind of realize like we could, we could break this up into smaller sections and we could spend four weeks just going through everything he says here. Um, he's pulling everything together. Everything that he's been saying really over two letters comes down to this. He has some last minute personal details, instructions he wants to give to Timothy, practical things he wants to go over. But more than anything, there's one clear final instruction. In light of everything else that Paul has said to Timothy, he ends with this. He says, preach the word. And Paul has talked about the importance of godly character in church leaders. He's, he's emphasized the importance of sound doctrine. He's challenged the, the myths and the endless genealogies, the empty religion of false teachers. He's warned Timothy to have nothing to do with people who would deny the power of the gospel. And all of these things, everything that Paul's been saying to Timothy, it points to this. What is Timothy supposed to do? Preach the word. In verse one, Paul begins by saying, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing and his kingdom. And so Paul sort of gives right, a command and the reason for it all in, in, in that sentence, right? So to charge someone is to entrust them with a task or a responsibility. You know, when I say I charge you to do this, it means, it means I'm telling you to do it. This is what I want you to do. It's not a request. It's not a suggestion. Paul's saying, the thing I'm about to tell you to do, that's going to be your primary responsibility from now on. But he's not telling him to just go and do this on his own strength. He says, in the presence of God and Christ Jesus. And so he's reminding Timothy that he stands in the presence of God. The God who said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And he's in the presence of Jesus who said, I am with you always. Right? So Timothy has a job to do, but he's not going to be alone in doing it. And Timothy knows this. He knows this is true, not only because of what God has said, but by his appearing and his kingdom. Now, appearing is, is this word. It comes up twice in, in our passage this morning. And it's a word that it can refer to one of two things. It could refer to Christ's resurrection or to his return. And theologically, I think the, the beauty of this is, is that we actually, you know, we don't have to decide which one it means. It can mean both. Everything that Paul says here, it can refer to resurrection or it can refer uh, to Jesus' return. Timothy can have confidence to, to do what, what God and what Paul is charging him to do because Jesus has risen and because Jesus will come again. Both of those things are true. Both of those things will give him confidence. However, I, I think because of, of, of how Paul talks about Christ's appearing later in verse 8, I think, we, I think we could rightly understand that Paul's talking at least primarily about the resurrection. And so that's the foundation of Paul's charge. That's the, the basis on which he is saying um, everything to Timothy here. The presence of God made known by the resurrection. That's the basis for what Timothy has to do now. So Paul identifies then what is he to do in verse two, preach the word. Preach the word. Now, when we think about preaching, we tend to think about, you know, sort of like what I'm doing right now. Um, that it's a, a formal presentation. Um, that it's something that, that, you know, hopefully has, has been sort of well-researched and, and planned ahead of time. Um, it's something, you know, preaching, we think of it as most often being given in the context of worship, in a church service, or, or maybe at, um, at a retreat. Um, but that's not really what Paul means here. Uh, when Paul says to preach, he's using a word that, that just means to publicly proclaim, to advocate for something. And this becomes immediately clear then when we see the occasions that Paul lists in the next few verses, because he says, in season and out of season. 
and when people will turn away from listening to the truth. And so that plain understanding of Paul's usage here is, is that to preach, to preach the word means to proclaim the word. In whatever you're doing, proclaim the word. And so then we just, we have to kind of think just real quickly. So what does Paul mean by the word? And last week in, in chapter three, we looked at how Paul talked about the importance of the Bible. And in those verses, he used words like sacred writings and scriptures. Um, and these are terms that commonly refer to sort of the Bible as a whole. Um, now we also would refer to the Bible's whole as the word of God. Um, but when Paul uses word, generally what he's talking about is the gospel, the message of the gospel, the word about Jesus died and resurrected. Um, Paul says that we should be people of the Bible. That's the thing he's talked about in chapter three, um, people who are rooted and established in God's promises. And then our charge, our job as God's people is to preach the gospel in everything we do. Our job is to tell people about Jesus, about his death and resurrection. And so that's the big final point that Paul wants to make. That's his last word to Timothy and also to us. That because Jesus is risen, we must proclaim the gospel. And so this means we proclaim the gospel. Um, he kind of gives us sort of three um, implications, occasions, um, uh, conditions, ways in which we preach the gospel, that we must proclaim the gospel consistently, confrontationally, and continually. And I sort of stole those and adapted them a little bit from, um, from another preacher, and then I made them into adverbs, which kind of makes them a little bit awkward, um, but we're just going to go with it. Um, so first, because Jesus is risen, we, we must proclaim the gospel consistently. Um, so in verse two, Paul says that we need to be ready in season and out of season. And so this means we need to be ready to tell people about Jesus at any time and at every opportunity that is presented to us. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to try and force conversations to be about Jesus, right? So if you're, you know, if you're talking to a, a friend or a neighbor about, about the new Gales that has opened in Brentford, you don't need to try to hijack that conversation and say something like, hey, you know who else makes good bread? Jesus. Jesus is the bread of life. Bet you didn't know that. Right? Paul's not saying, he's, he's not saying do that. Don't do that. Um, that's, that's awkward. And it's off-putting. And, and it's a bit of a non, -sec a non sequitur. Right? If, if the way you talk about Jesus is bringing up something that's not relevant to the conversation, it kind of can co communicate that Jesus is not relevant. You're just trying to shoehorn it in and, and make this conversation about something else. It can give the impression that you're not actually interested in the person you're talking to. Um, on the other hand, though, if you have a friend who invites you to go to brunch with them on a Sunday morning, well, that's an excellent opportunity to say, you know what, I would love to go to brunch with you um, on, like, on any other day, but I can't do it on a Sunday because I'll be at church. And that might lead them to ask, well, you know, couldn't you just skip one Sunday? And you say, well, well no, like, this is really important to me. This is, this is why. Let me tell you why it's so important that I go to church on Sunday, that I'm in the presence of Jesus and God's people. Um, and so that's a time when, when you might need to be ready to talk about Jesus, the hope you have in Christ. That's being ready in season and out of season. That we aren't called to proclaim the gospel just when it's convenient or when we feel like it. But every time we have an opportunity, we need to be ready to talk about the hope we have in Jesus. And, and that's the thing that Paul says, right? He says, be ready. It doesn't mean that we, we might not have the opportunity in every circumstance, but we always need to be ready, right? So that has to do with our own hearts, our own discipleship, our own continuing to love and follow Jesus so that we are ready because Jesus is risen, we must proclaim the gospel consistently. And next, because Jesus is risen, we, we must proclaim the gospel confrontationally. And, and this is the one that sounds most awkward as an adverb. Um, but, um, you know, but, but really it gets to the, the nature of what the gospel is. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I just made a point of saying 
that we don't want to be off-putting or weird, or we don't want to hijack conversations and make them be about Jesus when, when, when they really are just about, hey, how cool is it that we have a Gales in Bradford now? Um, but as Christians, you know, we, we, we want to be winsome. We want to speak with gentleness. We want, we want to speak with patience and kindness, right? Our hope is that the beauty of God's grace in our lives, that that might be attractive and welcoming to people who are lost, to people who are hurting, to people who are searching for peace. If we have friendships with people who, who aren't Christians, if we have family members who aren't believers, they need to know that we genuinely love them. Right? They're not just projects for us, but these are people who we love deeply. And so our attitude towards unbelievers, it doesn't have to be confrontational. It, it, it shouldn't be confrontational. It should be loving. And our proclamation of the gospel doesn't have to be confrontational. It doesn't have to be argumentative. But we have to remember that the gospel itself, that is inherently confrontational. The central message of the gospel is that Jesus died and rose again to save sinners. Salvation is for people who need to be saved. That means proclaiming the gospel is always going to call for repentance. Anytime we tell someone that Jesus is the only way of salvation, that means we're telling them that what they're doing right now, how they're living their life, what they're basing their life on, the direction they're going is all going the wrong way. They have committed themselves and devoted themselves to something that is leading to death. And so that is inherently confrontational. Verse two says that we need to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. And, and these are all pretty strong terms. Um, reprove means to disapprove or to reject. And that's how Paul often talks about these false teachers in Ephesus, right? He's, He's reproving them. He's saying, have nothing to do with them. Or to rebuke, that's the same word that is used in the gospels to describe how Jesus talked to demons when he ordered them to come out of people. And then to exhort, um, probably the softest of the three, but, but it's still, you know, exhort is like forceful encouragement, which almost seems, you know, sort of contradictory. It is this, this strong urge. It's to urge or, or really even to compel someone. So it's a much stronger sense than to just encourage. Um, these are confrontational terms. They describe pushing back against sin, pushing back against a life that is going the wrong direction and pushing forwards towards Christ. The gospel offers us forgiveness from sin and it offers us new life and victory over sin. But first and foremost, proclaiming the gospel has to confront our sin. If we shy away from confronting sin, we're denying the power of the gospel. We are in effect telling people that there's no salvation for them if we don't acknowledge their sin. The call to new life is always a call to repentance. And so because Jesus is risen, we must proclaim the gospel confrontationally, standing against the empty lies of the world we live in. And finally, because Jesus is risen, we must proclaim the gospel continually. So verse two ends by saying, with complete patience and teaching. And so this means that our charge to proclaim the gospel, that that's not just a one and done activity. There will be lots of times when we share the gospel with people and they will, they will reject it. They might do it politely, like, oh, it's nice that you believe that. They might do it with anger and aggression. But it doesn't mean that we give up. We keep proclaiming the gospel at every opportunity. Because for all of us, for all of us, it takes time to actually hear and to understand the message of the gospel. And even if we, if we're, if we just start to hear it, that doesn't mean we're ready to receive it and believe it. I mean, in my own life, I have no idea how many people shared the gospel with me before I was ready to receive it. But it was a lot. I mean, it was over a span of years in my life. And so that means that, that proclaiming the gospel, it requires what Paul says here, teaching and patience, right? It's something we have to keep doing. Um, 
And there's a book called Get Real um, written by a, a man named John Leonard. It's a, it's a book on evangelism. And, and in that book, what he says is that um, if, if we really want to engage in, um, in, in positive, effective evangelistic activity, um, what he says, what we should do is that we should disciple non-believers and we should evangelize believers. And so what he means by that is that with non-Christians, we need to spend time teaching them the Bible. His point is that if people are going to believe what we believe, they have to actually know what it is that we believe. You know, and so that's why we do things like, you know, we have, um, uh, you know, we, we can do Bible studies with unbelievers where we just sat down and say, hey, let's just read the Bible together so that you understand what it is that we believe. It's a process that takes time. And likewise, among Christians, you know, we can get into this place where we get all up into our heads and we start thinking about theology and we start thinking um, uh, about, about kind of all these other sort of categorical things. And we forget to talk about Jesus. We forget the central message that Jesus died and rose to save us from our sins. And so among believers, we need to always keep going back to that and preaching the gospel. And Paul says we also need to proclaim the gospel continually because there's a time coming says this in verse three, a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. He describes people as having itching ears. And what he means by that is that people only hear what they want to hear. Now, in in a world full of sort of social media and, you know, choose what kind of news source you want to hear, you know, it's not hard for us to imagine how fractured the world can become when people sort of hide themselves in their own echo chambers, right? Depending on who you choose to listen to, something like climate change, that could either be an existential, an existential, <clears throat> existential threat to all of humanity, um, or yeah, it's just an unproven hoax. Nobody knows that's real. Um, or gender equality, that's either about protecting vulnerable people or it's about erasing the rights of vulnerable people. Now, on both of those, I'm, I'm not saying that there is no truth to be spoken into those subjects. That's just not the topic of this sermon. Um, rather, the point is that people will take and they will hold a position, and then they'll refuse to listen to anything that doesn't suit them. And we know that's true. I mean, the hardest thing to admit is where we do it ourselves. But we know that people operate this way. And, and, and Paul said back in, in chapter three, verse 13, that these things are going to go on and they'll go on from bad to worse. Right? This time has already come in Ephesus. He says, you know, a day is coming, but actually he says, it's already here. It's already happening in Ephesus. The whole reason that Paul's writing to Timothy, um, the reason he's warning him and this warning that he's giving to us is that this is only going to get worse. People are are, are going to more and more only want to listen to what they already believe and what they want to hear. And so for us as Christians, if we lose sight of salvation as God's work for us, if we stop hearing the gospel, right, then we slip into the same kinds of legalism or false gospel or empty religion or the pursuit of myths, these things that were so prevalent in the Ephesian church, those same things you know, can and will happen to us if we stop proclaiming the gospel, not just to people who who aren't yet Christians, but to one another. The only way out of the echo chamber is to proclaim the gospel. And Paul says, with complete patience and with sound teaching, right? And so because Jesus is risen, we must proclaim the gospel continually. So that's kind of the like sort of three points and they all start with the same letter letter and there's sort of this nice arc and like this is the point where I'm like normally like ah, that's, that's kind of like the end of the sermon um and yet that's 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 three verses that only gets us to verse three now I'm not telling you that I'm going to keep preaching for like another like half an hour um but there's some other stuff that we that we have to look at that actually depends on what Paul has said here um we immediately get in these next verses, in verses six to eight, we sort of get this, this epilogue about Paul and kind of what's going on with him and why this is so urgent in what he's saying to Timothy. He says, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. 
Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. Um, so Paul knows that his death is near. I mean, one of the reasons why we can say all the way when we started in 1 Timothy, we can say, you know, Paul is in, or sorry, the, but at the beginning of, of 2 Timothy, Paul's in prison and he's pretty sure he's going to die there. The reason we can say that at the beginning of 2 Timothy is because we read ahead to the end and, and it becomes pretty clear. Paul, Paul knows that his death is near, but he also knows that his end is not the end. And so he picks up on these, these images that he's used earlier in the letter, things that he has used to encourage Timothy, things he said to him. Paul's now applying to himself. So in 1 Timothy 6, he, he told Timothy to fight the good fight of faith. In 2 Timothy 2, he said, he talked about an athlete um, is not crowned unless he, keep, unless he competes according to the rules. And 2 Timothy 1, he talks about follow the pattern you've heard from me and guard the good deposit entrusted to you. And so in the face of death, in the face of his own death, Paul speaks words of comfort to those he leaves behind. When he says that he has fought the good fight, Paul's not boasting about what he's accomplished, right? This isn't, you know, this isn't Paul bragging and going, yeah, I, I did great. I crushed it. I'm ready to die now. Like that's, that's not what he's doing. It's not good. Good is not about how well Paul has fought the fight. Good describes the fight itself. It's good because it's what God has called him to do. It's good because it's God's work of salvation. It's good because it points to Jesus. So when Paul says that he fought the good fight, he's saying that in the end, what's good is that his life has been hidden in Christ. And then he returns to this image of an athlete and he says that he's finished the race. But notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say that the race is finished, but that his race is finished. He's finished sort of his leg of the race. And, and so this immediately gives us the image of, of runners in a relay race, right? Runners line up on a course and each of them has their own leg of the race that they're responsible for. And when you hand off the baton, the next runner keeps running. So even when you've done your part, well, the race keeps going. And so that's what Paul, that's what Paul is doing here. He's, he's handing the baton to Timothy and he's urging him to keep running. And then he says, I have kept the faith. And this is an echo of, of, of his charge to Timothy earlier when he says to guard the deposit. Paul has done that. He's guarded what he has given. He's taught what he has been taught. He's handed the baton to the next runner. He's kept the faith, meaning he has been faithful to the very end of his race. Because see, Paul understands that, that the sting of death, that's not for those who die in Christ, but it's for those who mourn the loss, for those who have to continue on. In Philippians one uh, twenty one, Paul says, for me to live and to, for, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Right? Paul, for Paul, death means entering into the presence of Jesus. Right? He knows where he's going to be. But for Timothy, it means going on without his mentor, without his friend, without someone who was a father in the faith to him. When Paul speaks of his own death, he's using these, these echoes of the charges that he gave Tim Timothy because he's speaking to him words of comfort. He's reminding him that they're running the same race and that they're going to meet at the same finish line and that they will be awarded by Christ himself. And then Paul says, that's the promise for all who have loved his appearing, his resurrection. Everyone who places their hope in the power of Christ's resurrection, the same reward awaits all of us. And near the end of his, of his own life, um, uh, I had a couple of conversations with, with Stuart where he talked about the things that were weighing on his heart, the things he was thinking about a lot. And he wasn't worried about what was going to happen to him. You know, he knew where he would be. He was concerned about those he would leave behind. Right? He knew 
that his absence was going to be hard on his family. That it was going to be hard on his closest friends. That it was going to be hard on the church. And so we carry that weight because we loved Stuart. But we don't carry it without hope. Because Stuart loved Jesus. Because Jesus loved him. And so at his memorial service, these exact words were spoken of Stuart. That he fought the good fight. That he finished the race. That he kept the faith. So when we, when we started this sermon series, um, I thought primarily the, the reason that I thought it would be good for us to read Paul's letters to Timothy was mainly because of 1 Timothy 5, because that's where Paul gives instructions for what to expect of godly leaders, the qualifications for, um, particularly for elders, you know, as, as we are looking for a new minister, that these are practical and useful guidelines um, that would be helpful and encouraging to us. Now, if you'd asked me before, I think I would have told you, because I just know it's supposed to be the right answer, that, that there's more to it than that. But actually, studying these letters, reading them together, it becomes clear that there's so much more in these letters to Timothy. Again and again, Paul talks about how important character is for godly leaders. I mean, he, he never gives up on that that the character of godly leaders has to be the character of Christ. In contrast, he warns about the dangers of false teachers. And it's not just that they teach bad doctrine, but their character does not reflect that of Christ. And in the end of all of that, he urges Timothy and he urges us to keep going, to remain faithful, to never give up. Because Christ is taking us somewhere to a new heaven and a new earth. And so as we look for a new minister, we do it because that's exactly what Stuart would urge us to do. That he's finished running, but that the race isn't over. And so then we get these, these last few, you know, like personal instructions. Um, and they are a bit like... Um, a parent going over a checklist, right? Big and small things before you like leave your kid with the babysitter. Paul sort of crams in all of these personal greetings. And we're not going to actually go through and talk about who these people are or why he said this or why he said that or, you know, um, you know or that like, wow, Alexander must have really done Paul wrong. Um, we're not going to get to those, but, um, but we are going to talk about why, why are these here? Or what do they, what does their presence in this letter actually tell us about, about what Paul is saying? So all through these letters, Paul's been confronting false teachers who have devoted themselves to myths and to endless genealogies. And one of the things about myths is that they don't really have a specific time or place, right? They're sort of, they're sort of vaguely ancient and they take place long ago and far away. But Paul's instructions here, they're pointing to real people in a real time and in real places. And so Paul reminds us through something as mundane as, hey, bring me my cloak to try to come before winter, Paul's reminding us that the gospel is not a myth. It's not something that happens detached from the world we live in. It is a real message for the real world. And then according to Paul in verse 18, it's a message, it's the message of a savior who will rescue us from every evil deed and who will bring us safely into his heavenly kingdom. And so that's what the future holds for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? We aren't preparing for an uncertain future. We aren't prepping because we're afraid the world is going to end. You know, we're preparing because, oh, we know that the world as we know it will end. That Jesus is actually going to come back and make everything new. The way it was supposed to be in the, in the beginning and yet better. So we aren't preparing out of anxiety or out of fear or out of uncertainty. We're preparing for the day when Jesus will finish what he started. That day when he will make all things new. And so if you believe in that, if you believe in that coming, if you trust Jesus to bring you safely into his kingdom, if you believe that Jesus is the only way of salvation through his death and resurrection, 
Well, then because Jesus is risen, because we have a future and a hope, then we must proclaim the gospel. We tell people about Jesus, who he is and what he has done. Because his work isn't finished. Because he is coming back. Please pray with me.